glad you're here. We're going to be in the book of Isaiah tonight, and uh, Isaiah chapter 15. Uh, two things to mention before we jump right into the sermon, not to sidetrack us. Uh, but one, I now know the full potential of the good people of First Baptist Church. Previously, I did not know the potential, but Brother Mark, I know the potential. I know that you have voices, that you can lift your arms. You see, there's some of you that sit through every service and you sit like a stone-faced, just cold-hearted being until the pastor may miss a baptism. If you're in the service this morning, you know exactly what I'm referring to. And then heaven forbid, I forget the baptism, but, but as if a chorus of one was happening, arms were raised and the voices loudly proclaiming, baptism, ba- like, like you're alive out there. I now know, Brother Joshua, the full potential of First Baptist Church. All I have to do is forget a baptism, and my goodness, you're just, your spirit revives within you. And now you're ready to speak the truth, and uh, thank you for all your help. And so I, just, I, was, I was encouraged by that, so now I know the service tonight will be so moving. And if i got to throw someone back there in the water, I will to wake you back up. No, I won't do that. And then one other thing, just so I don't forget tonight, but some of you have asked me about this. The gossip chain is fast First Baptist Church. You'll notice over there, and, and they hate this, but I, I had the permission that Brother Merchant's sitting by a lady over there. And uh, Brother Merchant is uh, getting married to Miss Sue Bailey over there. And uh, I asked if I could mention it because many of you have, have texted me or called me and said, is Brother Merchant in fill in the blank? The answer is yes. And the Lord's in it, and we're excited. And sometime in August, being in August, so they're going to tie the knot there. They've asked me to be part of that ceremony, and we're looking forward to it. So now quit your, quit your talking, all right, and just go congratulate them. Absolutely, absolutely. And no that they hate everybody that announced it, but I had to because you guys have been blowing up my phone. Shame on all of you at First Baptist Church. Shame on you, but glad for them. But God bless you too. We're excited. See, it wasn't that bad, was it, bro? Don't, <laughs> all right. Isaiah chapter 15 tonight. Isaiah 15 and 16. The next few sermons in the book of Isaiah are going to be uh, judgment-laden sermons. The next few chapters in Isaiah, we have the burden of Moab, the burden of Damascus, and the burden of Egypt. Uh, three places that God is going to bring judgment on. And one of the benefits and one of the hard aspects of preaching chapter by chapter or subject by subject through a book is you just can't bypass the harder portions of Scripture. There are those, if you're just looking for randomly good passages, you would not instantly turn to Isaiah 15 and 16, though there is there's just some truth in there that I think will be helpful to us tonight. But being dedicated to rightly divide the word of truth, and I want this place to be a biblically founded church. We go through the Bible, and that's why I preach out of, out of books typically. And Sunday morning, I'll be in a series, and Sunday night in a series, and then usually Wednesday, I'll be in side series of that. But we go through the Bible, and so as we approach the next few weeks, and I have a little vacation there, so it may stretch out a little bit longer than that, but um, they're judgment passages. These are not the passages you turn to uh, when someone's in the hospital. I don't go to the bedside, listen, let me read you Isaiah chapter 15. The burden of Moab. Cry in the streets. Like, Pastor, what are you reading to me? You know, we'll read Psalm 23 or Psalm 100 or, or in the book of 1 John. And these aren't the passages that, that you read when someone comes for a dedication of a child. You know, wonderful parents up here and the burden of Moab. You're not preaching the burden of Moab when we're dedicating a child. But God had a very specific purpose from including in his word these judgments against pagan people and nations. Against men and women, husbands and wives, rulers, magistrates, who wholeheartedly rejected God's truth. Understand that though God is extremely, extremely patient, Don't confuse God's patience with his indifference. Don't be mistaken and and think in error that just because judgment has not come on wrong choices, on rejection of God and his holiness and his character and his essence, that God sits idly by twiddling his thumbs. God sits in the heavens and remember that I would say one of the over-encompassing themes of Isaiah 
is this idea that God is up here in his righteousness, in his holiness, in his work, in his thoughts, in his power, and we are down here. And the theme in Isaiah, God says, I am up here, and I am not like you, and you are not like me. But just the compassion of God in the sign of Isaiah to show over and over the messianic promises and prophecies that God says, even though I am up here, I will come down to you. And I will meet you, and if you follow me, if you come to me by faith and repentance, if you follow me and cling to me, you will see blessings like you have never experienced before. But the other side of the coin is this, but if you don't come to me, if you don't follow me, if you choose to live your life like you see fit, then my judgment must follow. This is not a surprise. This is not a surprise that God attaches a blessing and a curse. Throughout Scripture, we see this theme, that there are only two choices. There is God's blessing and the incredible benefit where our cup runs over. Or there's the judgment, and it's incredible judgment, and the judgment runs over. We could almost say it this way, that there are two extremes there's either, uh, there's either abundant life or overwhelming judgment. And God, throughout Scripture and throughout Isaiah, is repeatedly saying, but, but this judgment, and it doesn't have to come. You can have this. In my friends, in your life and in my life, the same two options are there. We can follow God and reap just blessings beyond comparison. And many of you, if not most of you, have at times, if not regular, regularly, experienced the blessings of God as you follow him. But if you struggle with the flesh like all of us are prone to, you've also experienced some of the judgment of God. And it ought to cause us to run back here. But sometimes we be stubborn. Or maybe I'm the only one in here in Mark. Mark, maybe it's you and me, right? You're the only stubborn ones in here. Anybody else with up raised hands say, you know, Pastor, if I'm going to be honest, I'm stubborn sometimes. You know what the Bible says? What brings repentance? What should be in Romans, in Romans? The goodness of God. The goodness of God. And so tonight as we kind of unpack Isaiah chapter 15, I will warn you now that we will be on a Bible journey. We are going to be in some different passages before we come to Isaiah chapter 15 to kind of understand the background, understand what is going on, answer some questions, and then uh, bring about just some thoughts from Isaiah 15 and 16 together. Both are, are encompassing this thought of the burden of Moab, and I believe it helped to us, and then just some final just reminders and thoughts for us. Let's have someone's blessing as we look at the burden of Moab tonight. Lord, as we come to your word, we need your help. I need you. Lord, we want to address uh, these verses with the utmost care. But Lord, we want to address in light of your character, your holiness, and your compassion and your patience. And Lord, I pray that tonight that you would illuminate your word to us. You would help us. Lord, may we understand your heartbeat and your holiness. And Lord, in response, cling to you and your way. Lord, we need you. I need you. And I want to give you the praise and glory for all that you accomplish in here, Lord. Bind the devil and his demons. May there be nothing that would distract us from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Throughout Scripture, we see this thought that God calls for repentance. From the earliest pages, when God is walking in the garden, he's walking and calling to restore relationship. And even when man, Adam and Eve, broke relationship with God by eating of the forbidden fruit and rejecting the one rule that God had, just one, one rule, they broke it. Even then, God was eager and willing to restore relationship. God, throughout Scripture, is eager to bring man back to fellowship with him. The book of Joel, we find, and we find this thought uh, to the children of Israel, and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repent of him of the evil. 
God's desire throughout Scripture, throughout life, and in our life, is that we will rend our heart, not our garment. The illustration there being that the children of Israel were great repenters. And when they, they were forsake something, they would rend their garment and show how, how bad they were. And Joel, God is saying to us, okay, so leave your clothes alone, all right, and make sure your heart is right with me. And God still desires a heart that is right with him. And so the, the encouragement throughout Scripture, throughout uh, the, the Bible, and tonight is rend your heart, not your garments. Don't just fix your way. Fix your path and your, your spirit before the Lord. The question is, though, as we look at Isaiah chapter 15, and we'll start there tonight if you have your Bibles open, and we see in Isaiah chapter 15, the first four words, the burden of Moab. We will come back to Isaiah chapter 15. But I'd like us to look and kind of understand who is Moab, what are they all about, and why is God pronouncing judgment on Moab? To kind of answer the question, did God, did God arbitrarily just pick a nation out of a hat? Did he just say, Isaiah, today I'm going to pick on Moab? Because that is a thought sometimes in people's minds that God is arbitrarily deciding who gets judgment and who doesn't get judgment. That God just randomly sends judgment on different people that God arbitrarily decides, well, they're going to be blessed and they're going to be cursed at some seemingly raffle going on in heaven. And nothing can be further from the truth. God is not sitting in heaven just waiting to see, oh, who's going to be next? Let me flip a coin today. Gabriel, your turn, heads or tails. Now it's Moab's turn. But there's a very clear path in Scripture why God was coming to Moab and coming after Moab. So if you would, first of all, turn to Genesis chapter 19. In Genesis 19, we have the beginning of Moab. Unlike the children of Israel, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moab had a much sordid and more sordid past. In Genesis chapter 19, verse 36. Genesis 19, verse 36, the Bible says, Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. And the firstborn bare a son and called his name, what's the word? And the same is the father of the Moabites unto this day. The children of Israel began with promise, began with hope and covenant. The children of Moab began with deceit and terrible surroundings. Words we could use, shocking, scandalous, disgusting, unregenerate, contemptible. The very beginning of Moab was just completely pagan. Turn ahead a few books to Numbers, chapter 22. In Numbers, we find another occasion to interact with, with Moab and the children of Moab. In fact, in the, the book of Numbers, we find now that the children of Israel are wandering in the wilderness. And they come to a place called Moab. In, Gen in I'm sorry, Numbers chapter 22, the Bible said the children of Israel set forward and pitched in the plains of, what's the word? Moab, that's how we know where we're at, right? Moab, on this side of Jordan by Jericho. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was sore afraid of the people. Now that's very, just a very compelling thought. Everything else that follows in this passage is based upon fear. Fear caused everything else. My friends, this is not the sermon, but don't let fear control you. When fear reigns in your heart, you will not please God. God had not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. When fear reigns supreme, you will be on a path that is displeasing to God. Everything else that goes on is because the Moabites were sore afraid. See what happens. Because there were many. And Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. 
Verse number four, and Moab said unto the elders of the Midian, now shall this company lick up all that are round about us as the ox licketh up the grass of the fields. And Balak the son of Zippor was king of the Moabites that time. He sent messengers therefore unto whom? Balaam. You remember Balaam now? Balaam had a donkey. Balaam was hired, the verse tells us, verse number six, uh, it says, come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. Balak, the king of Moab, hires Balaam the prophet to curse the children of Israel. You remember Balaam? Ask God, and God says, don't go. So Balaam does the thing that many people do. He asks God again, and God says, don't go. And Balaam does again the thing that many people do, men and women and children. They ask God again. God said no. God said no. And, he, and Balaam says, Can I, should I go now? He says, fine, but only say what I'm going to tell you to say. When Balaam goes, he does not pronounce a curse. And Balak is mad. I've wasted my money on you, Balaam. What are you doing? You've blessed this people. And Balaam will then instruct Balak the king on how to hinder the children of Israel. This is the land of Moab. He will tell him to send the women down. He will tell him basically to infiltrate them and cause them to worship false gods. This is also a theme in Scripture. True God versus false gods. And one part of that was in the Bible, be careful who you marry. Because if you marry the wrong person, they can pull you down the wrong path. We find just a few verses later, Numbers chapter, um, I'm sorry, a few chapters later, Numbers chapter 31. Turn just a few pages over. Verse number 15. In Numbers 31, verse number 15. They've been around Moab and these things. In verse number 15, And Moses said to them, How have ye saved all the women alive? Verse number 16, Behold, all these, behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord, the matter of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Let's go forward a few pages in Moab. What happens to Moab? Where do they go from here? Turn, please, to Judges, chapter number 3. We find in Scripture that, that the Moabites are a well-known country to the children of Israel. In Judges, chapter 3, some of you young people will, will remember that there was a really, really fat king. Any young, any young children remember his name? Shout out if you know it. Eglon, Eglon, Eglon the fat king. He was so fat, and God sent a judge. His name was, do you remember it? Lefty was not his name. He was left-handed. Come on, some of you know it. <laughs> Caleb, Caleb, Caleb now has purpose in life as a lefty. Some of you lefty life. Anybody remember his name? Ehud, Ehud. Judges chapter 3. Look at verse number 15. But when, the, oh, I'm sorry, verse 14. So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. But when the children of Israel cried to the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, Benjamite, a man of left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. One more chapter to turn to, please. First Kings chapter 11. Throughout this time, we've seen the beginning of Moab is, has not been good. That Moab has been dead set against not only God, but against God's people. And not just in a haphazard, removed way, but in a focused way in order to cause the children of God to commit spiritual adultery. The Bible says friendship with the world is enmity with God. And the children of Moab purposefully tried to have and cause the children of Israel to commit spiritual idolatry and adultery. They didn't want them to worship God through Balaam's counsel. One of the rules that God gave to kings was don't marry lots of wives. And every king that I have found, 
or almost every king, maybe save one, broke that rule. God said that the reason you shouldn't break this rule is that when you marry lots of wives, they will cause your heart to be pulled away from the true God. In 1 Kings chapter 11, we have the wisest man and the most foolish man in the Bible. The wisest man because God gave him wisdom from on high, and the most foolish man because everything that Solomon gave us in the book of Proverbs, he broke, read the book of Ecclesiastes. About strange women, Solomon broke that. Gaining much money and worshiping money, Solomon says he broke that. About how laughter would be good, he broke that. Wine and strong drink, he broke that. In 1 Kings chapter 11, verse number 1, but King Solomon loved many strange women. Together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidians, and Hittites. And slide down, please, to verse number 33 of the same chapter, verse 33 of, of chapter 11. And the Bible says, because they, that they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidians, and Chemish, the god of the Moabites. I'd like you to turn back to Isaiah chapter 15 now and 16. We understand that God throughout the years, hundreds of years, has put in the Moabites' path the truth. The children of Israel were not unknown to the children of Moab. Jehovah was not unknown to Moab. The true God and even his work was not unknown to the children of Moab. This is not an isolated nation who just sat there in their own ignorance. Who, it's not a jungle tribe that, that didn't know anything about God. This is a, a country, a nation, who over and over were exposed to the truth from Jehovah, from God. They heard about his works. They saw his works. They hired the prophet of God, Balaam. All right, they, they came into a country, the strange wives of, of, of Solomon, to a country where God was worshipped. They had exposure to God and the people of God and the things of God, and over and over they said, no. We will still worship. We will still follow. We will still embrace our own gods. So God pronounces here in Isaiah 15 and 16, judgment. It is not an arbitrary judgment, it is not random judgment, and it is a fair judgment. It is not a quick judgment, it is a patient judgment. And it is a just judgment, or with just cause, it is not out of spite. But lest we miss this point, we're in Isaiah chapter 15. And it was Isaiah chapter 2 where God first said, my people need to follow me. God did not jump first to the children of Moab. God jumped first to his own people and said, listen, you need to follow me. You must, I'm going to hold you more accountable. In fact, Peter says it this way, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. You see, where God begins the chastening is not out in the pagans, if I could. Though there are Christians who, that's what they want. They want to shout God's judgment on a, on a, on a fallen world. And they do it sometimes in the worst possible ways. And that is true. And God will judge. All right, God will judge. He is holy. But judgment must first come in the house of God. We must follow God. We, we who claim to know the truth. But, but the children of Moab were not without excuse. I want to point out a few points about this judgment. Notice, first of all, verse number one of Isaiah chapter 15. The burden of Moab. Because in the night... Ar of Moab is laid waste and brought to silence. Because in the night, Kir of Moab is laid waste and brought to silence. These are two cities in Moab, Er and Kir. And I would give this thought about this. The judgment of God seemingly comes quickly and unannounced. Notice he says it comes in the night when they're unaware and it seems as if when someone faces the, the judgment of God, that they seem like they're caught off guard. Though others who are watching this aren't caught off guard in the same way. Maybe you have observed this with someone else, or maybe you've seen it in your own life. 
where you've rejected God as path and, and things have not turned out well. And the fleshly reaction is, what? Me? It's like the professional athlete who gets called for a foul, right? And upon replay, they literally have a chainsaw out chopping part, body parts off. But in the moment, they're like, what? Hey, well, I didn't even touch them. Dude, you crawled up their back, you body checked them, you choked them out, and you shot them. It's probably a foul. Just watch the Euro Cup or the Copa Cup, Copa America. All right, it's amazing. Yet, yet we're guilty of the same thing. Like, life doesn't work out. We're like, what? what? How could that go so horrible? This is out of nowhere. All right, my friends, this was not out of nowhere. Though God says it'll come in the night. It'll come seemingly unannounced. And seemingly, it'll come quickly. But that there has been a long history of God's patience and God's truth and proclamation and declaration. Even these two chapters will show that God's judgment won't come for three more years. It is not quick, it is not announced, but it seems, uh, it seems that way, being caught off guard. I was driving home today after lunch, right by the highway, and I'd seen the state trooper pull out. And all of a sudden, the state trooper, I'm, I'm right by there, there's two lanes right there by the truck stop Cracker Barrel. And all of a sudden, the trooper is right next to me, like pulling around me to get the car in front of me. The car in front of me, a little, uh, maybe a, a burgundy SUV, a Chevy Blazer, I think it was, flicked on its lights. And this Blazer just whip, ripped to the side. I know, that driver messed their britches. Because the trooper seemingly came out of nowhere. And maybe this has happened to you before. Like, you're just minding your own business, it seems, and all of a sudden the trooper's like right there up in your grill, or a police officer. He was right there. Now, for this driver, it was a great thing because he did, the guy pulled over, or the lady, I don't know what it was, and then the trooper whipped around him and went back down on the highway. I guess there was some accident on I-75. And I know that, that that person, I said, they just messed their britches, and now they need to take a moment <laughs> to, to gain their senses before they get back on the road. The, the, the calmness that will come after that. But my friends, when God's judgment comes, it may come seemingly unannounced, but it's not. There's no one in this room who, can, who, who will be surprised if life doesn't work out when you don't follow God's plan. God's truth is here. It, it's around us, and, and it can be in us. Number two, notice this in verse number two. He has gone up to Bajith and to Dibon, the high places to weep, the places of worship, the false idols. Moab shall howl over Nebo, one of their gods, and over Mediba. On all their heads shall be baldness and every beard cut off. This first reference is that when judgment comes, these Moabites will look and cry and just follow a false god. They will look for relief in all of the wrong places. I could not help but think, back a few years ago, we had that little thing called the pandemic. Anybody remember that little pandemic? COVID, was it 18? COVID 20? What was that? Seemingly, it wasn't anywhere. You notice how when that happened, that, and I have no doubt that the hand of God was in some way, in some fashion inside of that, right? This world does not happen without God's handiwork. Very quickly, we could see that God can allow the world to shut down just like that. God doesn't have to send a catastrophe. He can send a small virus and everything shuts down. And where did many people run to? I'll tell you, the God of science. The God of science. This will save us. My friends, false gods can never save us. There are Christians who reign to the God of science rather than run to the true God. And God says, when I come to Moab, it'll come seemingly quickly and unannounced. And then these people, rather than turning to me, will quick run to their high places. It doesn't make any sense. God's judgment is coming. Run to God. Yet, too often, people then turn from God, blame God, get mad at God. Why would you let this happen? Why would you do this to me? How could a loving God allow this death? How could a loving God allow me to suffer this way? How could God, he doesn't even care about me. And God says, this is what will happen. When my judgment comes, people will run to their false gods and cry, make their head bald and their beards. They're doing all the things to try to satiate their false gods. Reminds me of those, those prophets, the false prophets of Baal, who are against the true prophet, right? And there are 450 of them, and they're dancing all around and cutting themselves, doing all the things they think will get a, their, their God's attention. In a recession, people run to the God of savings. 
and trouble, people run to the God of relief and stress to the God of addiction. You see, judgment should cause us to look to God, but too often we look to the false God. Look in verse number seven. The Bible says this, therefore the abundance they have gotten and that which they have laid up shall they carry away to the brook of the willows. What is happening here is they look at all that they've, they've gotten, that they've accumulated, their ease of life, and their ease at this time does nothing for them. They're literally fleeing their house, fleeing their lands, and they're carrying their possessions with them. All right, it's like I've talked about, I think it was on the Titanic, people were leaving and they were putting their silver and taking their silverware with them when the boat is sinking. Leave the silverware. Get on the boat. Get on the boat. What are the children of Moab doing in this judgment? They're taking the silverware instead of getting on the boat. You see, rejection of God makes it so we can't even process correctly. Their ease was their downfall. Look at verse number 9 of chapter 15. For the waters of diamond shall be full of blood. For I will bring more upon diamond, lions upon him that escapeth of Moab and upon the remnant of the, of the land. The Bible says here that even those that escape, even those that escape will not escape ultimate judgment. If they continue in, in their sin, they may be preserved from one judgment, but only reserved for another. But then it seems as if Isaiah chapter 16, which continues the thought, shifts in like the, the, the timbre of the passage. Because God is not looking to rejoice in this. Look in, in Isaiah chapter 16, verse 9. Therefore I, and it seems to be the heartbeat of God, I will bewail with the weeping of Jezreel, the vine of Sibma. I will water thee with my tears, O Heshbon and Leah, for the shouting of, for thy summer fruits and for thy harvest is fallen, and gladness is taken away, and joy out of the plentiful field. And in the vineyards shall there be no singing, neither shall be shouting. The treaders shall tread out no wine. In the presses I have made their vintage shouting to cease. You see, God is full of compassion. And even here, God is saying, at this moment, when this happens, there is not joy there is not gladness, but sadness and sorrow. We could read these two chapters and say, well, well, Pastor, okay, that's great. God judged Moab. Wonderful. And he did. And he did. What does it mean to you and to me? Well, I think there's a, a couple thoughts that we need to walk away with tonight. Number one, remember this. God is holy. We find this throughout the book of Isaiah. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. You can worship false gods. God has given you that choice. But God is holy. And ultimately, he is a jealous God. He will not tolerate. He will not tolerate worship of false idols. He will not share his glory with anything or anyone. God retains ultimate authority and power in this life and in the next. And we must strive to be holy. Be holy for I am holy. We see God's mercy. Verse 14 of chapter 16. But now the Lord hath spoken, saying, Within three years, as the years of an hireling, and the glory of Moab shall be contemned, and with all the great multitude and the remnant shall be very small and feeble. Even in this judgment passage, God says within three years. God didn't have to make an announcement, did he? God would be perfectly just and righteous to just send judgment. Yet God is, is merciful and he's full of compassion. There's one more kind of thought that struck me as I was studying this passage. Seemingly unrelated, but beautiful in light of who God is. Though we walked through Scripture. I carried you through from Genesis, Judges, Kings. I left out one person in one passage. And she's found in the book of Ruth. If you would, take a moment, just turn to Ruth chapter 1. 
I'll read a verse and give you two thoughts and close the service out. Because Ruth was a nasty place. I'm sorry, Moab was a nasty place. Moab was a pagan place. Moab, the background, the history, the judgment coming, all, all of it was anti-God, anti-God's people, anti-God's way. And yet snuggled there in all of this, just a picture of God's calling and God's goodness, we have a little character by the name of Ruth who came to know God because of some children of Israel who actually weren't even living for God. They, they left when they shouldn't have left. And they left in famine, and, and they went to another, to another country. They went to Moab, a place where God was not. And they, and they sat there in this country, and, and then they come home, and when they come home, when they come home, Moab comes with, I'm sorry, Ruth comes with, her mother-in-law. And look at verse number 16. A verse that many ladies have mentioned, sermons have been spoken about. But just listen to what Ruth says in light of who Moab is. In light of impending judgment, probably about a thousand years later. In light of the anti-God thoughts in Moab, the false gods, the idols. And verse number 16 says this. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. What I love is the fact there's always a chance and always an opportunity to make a difference. You could be the voice, the one who calls to the one in Moab. You could tomorrow be the one to influence. Isaiah here was called by God to proclaim these judgments. And we find in history that God did just that. He fulfilled his word. But God has called us to be salt and light, to stand up for Jesus Christ. And you could be the one lady the one man, the one teenager, to that Ruth. You see, God's grace is there, God's compassion, and you may be the voice that brings repentance. What I think is unbelievable is that Ruth is found in the lineage of Jesus Christ. That is just like our God who says, down here, this nation I will judge as a nation they have rebelled against me, they have rejected me, they've been nothing but wicked and sinful, and just to show how good and how merciful, I will, bring, I will offer my compassion to this nation, and one will follow me, and I will use her to bring about the one who will be the Savior of all men. This is the God who is way up here, who comes down to us, we're way down here. When we read about these burdens of Moab and a little week's burden of Damascus and Egypt, it could, should cause us to have that holy compassion and that love for the lost. So you know what? God's judgment is coming. But this co-worker may be a Ruth. This cashier may be a Ruth. And God's compassion has not failed yet. And though judgment will come, God's mercy is so vast.